you know, uh, stop, stop screwing around with the lifestyle stuff. It's the food. Hey, Chuck here from Brand New Vegan. Do I have a special gift for you today? This is a one-hour interview with none other than Dr. John Madugo himself, like you've never heard him before. Stay tuned. John McDougall is a legend in the plant-based community. Has been teaching this starch-based program for well over what is it now? Forty years? Well, yeah, probably forty. Yeah, forty years. Nineteen seventy-seven. So, there you go. His entire program is available for free on his website, drmcdougall.com, as well as links to his other more intensive programs like the ten-day live-in, the extensive weekend three-day program. Uh, you also have a free quick start program. You have a, a dietary therapy program where medical professionals can earn ECU credits. Your latest book, The Healthiest Diet on the Planet, the one you said you were never going to write, <laughs> is based on your famous color picture book, which is also available for free on your website. I have heard you speak many times now about your color picture book, where you explain in a very, and I do mean very simple, universal way, exactly what foods we have to eat, what foods we shouldn't. Enough, you said, for your grandchildren to understand. <laughs> and it is very understandable. Eat this, don't eat that. So I will link that color picture book and your one-hour video below. And I ask my readers to watch it and write down their questions. And this is what we have for you. Are you ready? I'm ready. Number one, can you ask Dr. McDougall what happens if a person does not take a B12 supplement? Well, probably nothing. Uh, the risk of B12 deficiency, except for criticism, of course, you know, people are going to, it's the only criticism people can lodge against what you're doing, which is a low fat vegan diet that has any scientific merit at all, but you've got to kind of put it in perspective. Uh, B12 deficiency was the last vitamin deficiency discovered. It was discovered, uh, well, maybe a hundred years ago, uh, and uh, B12 deficiency, what they found was that uh, maybe there's a, a risk of one in a million of getting B12 deficiency. Uh, but I wouldn't want to have any criticism at all about the diet I recommend. So since I started this about 40 years ago, I've been recommending that people take a non-animal source of B12. Uh, how, how often has this been reported in the medical literature as far as an actual disease? Uh, caused by the absence of B12 in the diet? Well, you know, the argument goes from maybe never to as many as maybe 10 cases uh, that I can find. Now, metabolic change is true. Uh, you can find some metabolic changes, but as far as actual problems, which are an anemia that occurs, which is easily reversible, and also paresthesias or tingling of the fingers and toes, uh, which is reversible until late stages. And there have been claims as great as uh, vegans going blind, which is uh, a complete nonsense. Uh, this particular case uh, study or studied in the New England Journal of Medicine. So, you know, I think the best way for that I'd recommend that your listeners handle it is how Mary and I handle it. Uh, we have a uh, bottle of methyl and a bottle of hydroxy and a, maybe even a bottle of cyano, uh, gabalamin, which is B12. Uh, on our shelves, we take uh, a variety of different B12 pills because there's some argument as to which forms of the B12 are you know, particularly effective. So probably we remember to take it maybe once a month. And my recommendations are to take uh, five micrograms a day. I've been recommending that for 40, you know, 45 years. Uh, the problem is, is they only sell them in 500 or 1,000 or 5,000 micrograms. So, you know, it's pretty easy to uh, take B12 sporadically and get all the B12 you'd ever need. If, if you ever really need it, as I say, B12 is made by bacteria. Uh, most of us live a relatively unhygienic uh, lifestyle, and you get plenty of bacteria. But, hey. Why, why, why would I even bother to open myself to any possibility right. of criticism? Because there's no such thing as protein deficiency or amino acid deficiency or calcium deficiency or you know any other vitamin deficiency based on uh, consuming adequate calories 
that are uh, made up primarily of starches with the addition of fruits and vegetables. Get a little sunshine, you know, get a few bacteria or take a B12 supplement, go for a walk. You know, try and uh, live as happy a life as you can. I, I don't know what else to tell you. It's pretty darn simple. The problem, of course, is a uh, problem of uh, massive uh, worldwide now, uh, food epidemics. And, uh, the, you know, the best and simplest way I've been able to describe this for people is we're suffering from food poisoning. Uh, what does this food poisoning look like? Well, remember the kings and queens of old. You know, fat, gout in their feet, uh, diabetes, if you knew something about them, they were sick. And why are they sick? Well, they gave up the peasant food. What was the peasant food? It was potatoes in South America. It was corn in uh, Central America. It was rice in the Far East. So, you know, they gave up the, uh, the food, the starches that the common person ate. We're talking about 99.9% .9 of their population. And uh, they fed their share of the starches, the rich people did, to the pigs and the cows and <laughs> the sheep, pheasants and so on. And you know, took this extra step on the food chain and uh, started to eat like kings and queens. And they looked like kings and queens 4,000 years ago. You know, the difference now is we have half of a world population, about 4 billion people that can afford to eat like kings and queens. And uh, the result is, is overnutrition is, a, is the world's biggest problem. Completely and agree. And it's huge. I completely agree. Yeah. Okay, good. Moving on. Why do some people not lose weight on the Badugal program? Well, they cheat. <laughs> you know, it's simple. It's it's uh, it's either uh, they cheat uh, out of uh, uh, me not being able to convey the message properly, which I've tried to do. Uh, I made every effort I can, but you know, communication is a difficult thing. Sometimes people don't understand, and we have a tendency to hear what we want to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, maybe it's a bit of misinformation. Maybe it's not willful, che willful cheating, but uh, it's pretty basic. It's like, it's like walking up to me and telling me as a doctor uh, that you as a drunk are not going to get sober if you give up booze. You know, I mean, it just doesn't, it always happens. Uh, it's just like you as a cigarette smoker. You come to me and you say you're going to give up 40, 60 cigarettes a day. Uh, you always stop smelling like a tobacco factory. You always uh, improve your breathing. You always, uh, you know, cough less. Uh, you know, it, it always happens. So if you're being poisoned by the rich Western diet and you switch over to a healthy diet, the human frame is designed to carry a, cer a certain amount of fat for best survival. And if you look through history, and that history is going to be as recent as 35 years ago, if you look through history, you see that the populations that lived on starch-based diets, like, for example, I can re remember the Vietnamese conflict. You know, I'm that old. Uh, my parents came up from a time when they uh, had conflict with the Asians, the Japanese in particular. And uh, there were no fat people in Asia. Absolutely no, none, period. And they lived on uh, primarily rice. 90% of their diet was rice. And you can go to Central America and remember the days when um, your Hispanics, your Mexicans, your Guatemalans, uh, you can remember the day, I can remember the day when there were no fat people in these countries. And now, of course, that's all changed. And of course, it changed with the patterns of food. So you tell me if somebody walks up to me and says that, uh, you know, I, I follow I follow your recommendations strictly and I can't lose any weight and I need to lose weight. I mean, you're not going to lose too much. I mean, I've stopped losing weight when I got down to turn body weight. Uh, if you tell me that, I'm probably not going to confront you. You know, I'm going to ask you if you understand what I, what you ought to do. I may make some uh, snide comment like there were once no fat Chinese uh, <laughs> and there were two billion people. But, you know, generally, I'll just try and encourage people to to uh, get on with their learning, their understanding and keep trying and trying and trying. Uh, this is not an easy change, uh, particularly when you have the whole world fighting against you from your taste buds to your visual sensors to your, no, I mean, it's every place, uh, to your inability to get healthy food. Uh, it's a tough world to live in if you want to be healthy, but you can. You can save money in many, many ways. I mean, there's every reason to do it. 
I tell people now that I've come back from the Remedy event that it was an amazing event. And when the food is laid out for you, as it was for us, I stuffed myself, literally, three meals a day, three days in a row. And when I came home, I had lost five pounds. Yeah, well, <clears throat> yeah, probably a couple of those pounds were water. Yeah. And, uh, you know, our average weight loss in seven days and we've studied about thousands of people. We've reported on uh, almost 1,700 people. Uh, our uh, weight loss in seven days on average is uh, a little over three pounds. If you take overweight people, then of course it becomes more. Right. But uh, yeah, weight loss is, uh, is expected in those who need to lose weight. A little exercise helps, but it's not necessary. Uh, it's not necessary to maintain good health and it's not necessary to lose weight but if you want to be as fit as possible, uh, and I do encourage exercise with care, then you need to exercise. So you absolutely need to get sunshine. Yeah. Uh, crucial. Especially up here in Oregon where we're at. Yeah, you know, this is one of the things. Uh, I, I've been coming to Portland. In fact, I saw AM Northwest on the uh, <clears throat> uh, TV stations this morning. It's a show that I used to do once or twice a month because I knew the owner of the station. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was welcome here in Portland to sell my books 30, 35 years ago. And I don't remember a day in Portland where the sun shined, even though I was up here, you know, every month. Mm -hmm. uh, now I have to tell you your weather, our weather, because I'm, of course, a Portlander now. Uh, <laughs> our, our, weather, our weather is just like it was in Santa Rosa uh, 10 years ago. Now, not 30 years ago, but 10 years ago. And, uh, you know, things are changing rapidly. Uh, but people tell me, they tell me, look, I live in uh, uh, up here in Oregon or in Alaska or whatever. I, I can't get enough sunshine. Well, most of the people we're talking about who are native to this particular part of the world have very light skin. Uh, and if you go through Portland, you will see that many, many people have found sunshine. Just look at their roofs. And you'll find all kinds of solar panels. So yep. it's got to be some sun up here. And I understand if you go a little bit further north at the border of Vancouver, I mean, way up there in Vancouver, Canada, <clears throat> there's a forest that starts called the Great Bear Forest. And that all goes all the way to the southern border of Alaska. If you mm -hmm. can grow a rainforest, you know, you can certainly get enough uh, ultraviolet radiation to yeah. grow all the all the uh, vitamin D that you possibly need. But there's more than vitamin D that comes from sunshine. It's just crucial that you get it. But it has to be appropriate for your skin tone. And that's changed a lot as people have migrated all over the world. You know, I migrated south and, you know, I'm a really white skinned guy. And uh, when I lived in Hawaii for many years, what happened is I, I was out of my environment and I burnt my skin. And there are a lot of dark-skinned people who moved from the equator north who live in Portland now. Not many, but a few dark-skinned people yep. in Portland. And, uh, you know, they have to realize that they come from a part of the world where sun was a, a bigger, bigger exposure to them. And they have to make extra effort to get sunshine exposure. Uh, it's crucial. And you're not going to replace it with a vitamin D pill or shot. As a matter of fact, you're going to hurt yourself if you take this form of remedy. Vitamin D is toxic when it comes in the pill or injection form. Don't do it, uh, except in very rare circumstances. And uh, probably nobody I'm talking to right now falls in those very rare circumstances. Uh, anyway, you need to be, you need sunshine, period. I think a lot of people don't realize the fact that, and I've heard you say this, that vitamin D is actually not a vitamin at all. It's actually a hormone. Right. Yeah, the body makes, a, makes a, quote, vitamin D. But the body cannot synthesize uh, vitamins. That's why they're vitamins. They have to come from the outside. But the, the bo body takes precursors of uh, vitamin D that are actually forms of cholesterol, uh, forms of plant sterols, not cholesterol, forms of plant sterols and converts them in the skin through the energy of sunlight into various forms of active vitamin D. But the kidneys and liver are involved in the processes and so on. It's a, it's a big deal. It's a total body function. It's crucial, crucial that you get sunshine. Not too much, but enough. 
And Very what, good. what is enough? You know, if we're talking to people in Portland, we're talking to primarily light skinned people. Uh, probably five, ten minutes a day would be plenty for you at noon. Or, uh, you know, a nice summer vacation where you spend a couple of weeks in the sun. You know, that'd be that'd probably get you through the year. Okay, perfect. Moving on to the next question. Dr. McDougall, I was just diagnosed with, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, osteopenia, right. thinning bones. I have been whole food plant-based for almost 10 years. What foods should I focus on to help improve my bone mineral density? Okay. Well, first, first of all, let's talk about this is a real disease, osteoporosis is, and osteopenia is supposed to be the precursor of uh, uh, osteoporosis. <clears throat> Uh, osteoporosis is uh, primarily caused by the high-protein Western diet. Uh, I'm specifically uh, pointing out uh, animal foods, uh, specifically, well, all of them. Uh, but you need to know that uh, hard cheese is the most acidic of all the foods, uh, fish and chicken, beef, and so, so on. Uh, they are all, all very acidic foods. And when that acid comes into the system, it has to be buffered. It's buffered by the bones, which dissolve. And that's how you set the foundation for osteoporosis. Also for kidney stones, because these, this bone material solidifies in the kidneys in many people. Uh, that said, you need to keep your bones healthy. And that involves sunshine, uh, safe exercise, and uh, eating an alkaline diet. And an alkaline diet, in other words, a diet without all that acid, uh, is primarily fruits and vegetables. Uh, so uh, that's where you need to focus. Now I have to tell you, I you know run into this, I've run into situations where uh, people have had actual osteoporosis. They needed a little additional care. You know, after all, I'm a board certified internist. I'm a regular doctor. Mm -hmm. and so what I'll do is I'll add uh, an alkaline material to their program. And that would be most simply obtained by uh, having them buy antacids, such as uh, Tums, in the in the local pharmacy. Uh, that's an alkaline material that would help neutralize uh, some of this acidity of the body. So I'll put people on a couple, couple of Tums. And again, this is a, 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 a very unusual remedy for me to offer. And I'll also put them on um, estrogens women on estrogens because that always forms bone and again we're talking about you know this is not the normal way you you go about things having people take pills and creams and so on but you know sometimes i think uh, i'm doing more good than harm by adding uh some of the tools that we do in standard medicine okay that said if you look at my website and you look under osteo or hot topics under osteoporosis you'll find a whole discussion i have on uh, how uh, bone marrow density is in a blunt tool. It's really inadequate uh, as far as telling what bone strength is. In fact, Medicare, Medicaid would not pay for bone marrow density tests up until, oh, I only guess, 10 years ago. Uh, then they got talked into it. It's a, a rather unreliable test. <clears throat> well, you, you should realize that about three quarters of women flunk the test by the age of 70. Now, when three quarters of women flunk a test, you have to wonder, maybe we're setting the norms for the test uh, incorrectly, or maybe maybe a massive number of women are doing something terrible, and that, of course, yeah. both are true. But uh, if you look at it from this point of view, that this is a, a natural thing to happen to women, to lose their minerals as they age. Uh, when you're in your reproductive years, you store about two pounds of mineral to make the bones for your babies. And you store that two pounds to make uh, food in the form of breast milk for your babies. So you store those extra minerals in your bones. Uh, those are during your reproductive years. When you hit menopause, the body says, there's no reason for me to carry around these extra minerals. And so it just dumps the extra minerals. And that's why nearly you know, the, the vast majority of women uh, in their postmenopausal years, have a low bone mineral density because they're supposed to. <laughs> you know, that's that's the way nature intended it. 
Uh, and that's why bone mineral density is a, a poor reflection of actual bone strength. Yes. And drugs, the drugs are very expensive, very toxic. Uh, again, you really need to keep the bones healthy by eating a good diet, an alkaline diet, with the addition of a little bit of careful exercise and a little bit of careful sunshine. Make sure you get enough, not too much. You know, we went through that. Okay. I like this one. Have you found that magic bullet to make people adopt this lifestyle who know it's the truth, right? but just don't want to give up their eating habits? It's hard. You know, it's very difficult. Uh, I've been working on that magic bullet my entire career, which expands <laughs> now to over 50 years. Uh, <clears throat> You know, I, 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 I used to think the severity of their con condition would be a motivator, but I've learned that's not necessarily the case. Uh, some people are motivated by things as simple as uh, bad body odor or, you know, their mother or dad died prematurely of breast cancer or heart disease. And uh, others, you know, there can be an elephant sitting on their chest and they won't change their diet. So I, I, I figured out a long time ago that I have to offer uh, this opportunity to everybody and not prejudge who's going to do it and who's not not going to do it. Uh, I've uh, made an effort to make things as simple as possible. That's why the healthiest diet on the planet. That's why it's a color picture book. And when I said I wasn't going to write any more books, basically I was telling you the truth. I put together a color picture book with a substantially lower impact of the words than the pictures. So, uh, you know, we tried to make the uh, the education as simple as possible by telling people that food poisoning comes in the form of two categories. That makes it easy. Uh, anything from an animal. Uh, that means their bodily secretions. Uh, that means they're any of their body parts. So anything from an animal and also any free oils. Those would be oils that have been extracted uh, from say the orange or the nut or the seed, yeah. Uh, those oils are not, they're no longer food, they're just uh, isolated and mostly toxic uh, substances that have certainly some medicinal changes, but you know, you get side effects along with maybe some positive effects. So you stay away from the free oils. And if you wanna lose weight, you stay away from the nuts, seeds, avocados, and uh, you know, you really focus on staying away from the high fat plant foods, at least until you get trim. And trim people actually often have to add a little bit of this high fat plant food to their diet. So there's some variation you might want to take. Right, right. So, you know, I've done that. Uh, we've uh, up until recently ran adventure trips all over the uh, of the northern and southern hemisphere. And they've been a lot of fun. Take between 80 and 150 people someplace in the world. Uh, we run weekends uh, in Santa Rosa, California, which we still do. We mm -hmm. run two weekends a year. And uh, we have uh, 10 days of uh, uh, really, really enjoyable brainwashing that takes place uh, six times a year for the general public, where our staff just gets in there and, you know, takes care of you. Uh, we have a professional medical staff. We have board certified uh, doctors and they practice standard medicine. But the goal is to get you off of any unnecessary drugs because sick people take drugs right. and, uh, get to avoid uh, any unnecessary surgeries because sick people go to surgery. So, uh, our, you know, it's a heavily uh, focused medical program by uh, very well-trained doctors. And then in addition to that, we uh, help you change your diet. It takes about four or five days for most people to make the adjustment under this controlled situation where we were with another 49 people. Uh, there's a lot of peer pressure. Uh, the food is really good. We allow salt, which people love. And uh, anyway, it takes about four or five days and then they're off most of the medications. Our published results are nearly published in the scientific literature. Uh, nearly 90% of people are can reduce or get off their medications. Uh, in particular, their diabetic medication and their uh, for type 2 diabetes and their blood pressure medications. Uh, so, you know, they get all these positive rewards. They feel better immediately. The balls start working. 
Uh, they've got more energy. They don't like taking the drugs. The side effects of the drugs are substantial. They get to eat as much as they want. Uh, usually they see some weight loss. As I said, our average weight loss in seven days is three over three pounds. They see the cholesterol drop. The average drop of cholesterol is, <laughs> excuse me, 22 points in a, 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 a seven days, 22 points, milligrams per deciliter. If you want international units, it's, uh, you divide by 38 to get IUs. Anyway, those are some of the results we get. Uh, and when people leave, you know, generally they think it's the best money they've ever spent. Uh, and that that is uh, along with their most enjoyable vacations. Uh, they've made friends. Uh, they've uh, gotten a whole new understanding. They have uh, gained control. This is one of the things about all of our staff is our goal is to give people uh, insight uh, to mm -hmm. get them to open their eyes. Uh, there's there's no sense in uh, telling somebody something that they have to believe in, that they can't substantiate in their own world. And so what our goal is, is to uh, open your eyes so that you can see things from the point of view that we see them. And uh, all of a sudden, everything becomes uh, real to you. Uh, you know, things you couldn't explain in terms of uh, how you were being cared for and why so-and-so didn't do well or did do well, et cetera. Uh, it all, all becomes obvious. Uh, once you understand that people are sick from food poisoning, yeah. and this food poisoning is just a blip in the uh, history of Homo sapiens, just a blip in terms of the massive number of kings and queens. I mean, it's only been going on for 50 to 100 years. Uh, depends upon what population you look at, but still, I mean, it's just a modern phenomenon. It's actually, I could date it for the last 35 years. It's really been a problem for planet Earth. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, 35 years, you know, compared to how long have we been around? 750,000 years? How long has the hominid been around? Three million, three million years, you know, uh, primates. A blip, and unfortunately this blip is a very, very painful blip. Not just for all the people suffering from disease, but for the poor planet, which yes. of course is my whole focus of attention. So ladies and gentlemen, if you want to learn all about how I practice medicine, I put it down on paper for you. I wrote everything that I I knew. It's uh, pretty much all free on my website. I've recorded it all for you also on videotape. And that's free on my website also. Uh, that's about how you take care of people. You know, why you're sick, how to get well, what you do with the drugs, et cetera, how you deal with your doctors. Uh, you know, it's all there. I'm done. Uh, I used to be declared ahead of my time. I have to tell you, there are thousands, if not tens of thousands of uh, young, in, young in spirit, young in mind, uh, most of them young in body too, uh, physicians, dietitians, nurses, other health professionals out there who have really uh, uh, learned the, some of the truths that I've funneled together. From my mentors, by the way, uh, I didn't discover all this. Uh, but anyway, they, 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 it's out there. It's, it's, it's uh, as they say, the, the genie is out of the out of the bottle. And, uh, you know, I, I could continue to uh, spend my time focused on this, but I've already done that job. Uh, so I, I'm moving on to something that I believe is uh, more crucial. And that is uh, my focus is on doing my little part, which I think is going to be extremely important, even though it is a tiny part of the picture. Uh, my little part in helping change uh, our uh, doomed destiny. Uh, planetary destruction. Yeah. Uh, we have an emergency going on. If you don't understand that, then uh, you know you might as well. I don't know. You might as well get yourself educated because this is an emergency, and we have no time to act uh, or to think about it. Uh, we have a card to play. It must be played. I don't care whether you build and give away for free. You know, 10 million Teslas to the to the world's population. I don't care whether you put solar panels on everybody's house. I don't care whether you plant every acre with uh, forests. Uh, until, unless you play this card, which, by the way, can be played overnight. And that is a shift uh, in the trend, which, by the way, has been a worldwide trend, which is going in a very bad direction. Uh, a shift from livestock 
as a source of calories back to the traditional human diet, the homo sapien diet of starch, like corn for the people in Central America, potatoes for those in South America, rice for those in the Far East. We have to do that now, and uh, you, your listeners, your listeners, I mean, I know you're concerned. I know you're concerned, even if you don't have grandchildren like I do. Uh, you, you, you don't want the human race and every other species to go extinct on this planet uh, for something we caused. So, you know, even if you can't change the world today, you can change what you do today. Right. And I, I realize, and you, st- you said it very clearly, uh, I realize a lot of people understand this. Uh, we were t- talking in terms of their own personal health and changing and getting the health that they deserve. Uh, but it's the same thing with the climate. And the planet. You know, I know people understand. Uh, I know they're concerned. But do you understand enough? Are you, are you concerned enough to take action? Uh, you know, I'm trying to do what I can do, which, of course, I'm in a, uh, a more visible position than most other people. But there's something you can do, too. I don't care what your, you know, what your position in life is, uh, whether you're an attorney or you're a school teacher or you're a housewife or you know, you're a child, like, who's making all the difference? Greta Thunberg, a 15-year-old girl who stood up to adults and said, hey, grow up, grow up. You know, and, uh, I just, uh, you know, I'd be proud to be her grandpa. But, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's really time for you to stop. Uh, and I really, I mean it, uh, for you to stop uh believing that it's true and it's time just to take action, whatever action you can. You've got talent. Uh, just just look good or, you know, uh, we all have to do this. We can do this. I help as many people as I can who ask me because they see that I'm a, I'm a blogger and they kind of get curious and what do you do as a blogger and how many people do you reach and you're, you're – you're making a living doing this. And it's like, yes. And we can, anybody who wants to do this, I will teach them how, because if we're spreading your message, we're spreading the food message. That's one easy way we can get people to save the planet themselves. is just by changing the foods they eat. Right. You know, and, and they really need to be out in the streets. Uh, I, I don't, I don't know how old you are, Chuck, but, uh, when I, when I was uh, asked to go down for my draft physical, you know, for my induction physical, and by the way, I was 4F at that time because I'd had a massive stroke. But once I became a doctor, I was all, all of a sudden I was uh, 1A. You know, probably people don't, you know, most people don't understand those designations. But it got you a card to stay home or go to Vietnam, depending on how you were classified. Right. And back then when, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of us of our age were going off to Vietnam involuntarily. But we did something about it. This is far more important than what we went through what, in the 1960s. Far, far, far more important. Why aren't you out in the streets? You know, I, I know some of you are, you're starting, but you need to be out in the streets. I mean, if we get, just get, I'll tell you one action, I could, uh, and I haven't really thought about this enough to uh, you know, to give you a 10-point plan on what needs to be done. But just one action. What if, what if every young person, every person under 30, refused to go to a fast food restaurant all over the world ever again? And they just boycotted them. That's all. You go eat someplace else. Go eat at, you know, Mama's Grilled on the street or, you know. But don't go to McDonald's. Don't go to Burger King. Don't go to Kentucky Fried Chicken. Don't go to any of those. And uh, make this a, a, a theme, uh, like, like, like next Saturday, or even for a day, even for one meal. Good grief. You can set mm-hmm. one meal to tell the world you're really concerned. Uh, I don't know where else to hit them hard. We suppose we could stop driving cars, but, you know, so, boy, and all that. But this is re- can you imagine how we get their attention if uh, every young person, and maybe they could get their parents and grandparents to join in? Uh, you know, just boycott at all fast food restaurants, period. Oh, but we serve salads here at McDonald's. Uh, we serve an Impossible Burger here in whatever Impossible Burger land. 
I don't care. You also you advertise where's the beef. Yes. You know, beef the beef is killing the planet. Okay, stop it. Uh, no, I have seven grandkids. Stop it. I have four. So anyway, but well, we got a lot of work to do, and we have to do it yesterday. That's the problem. Yes, and I'm 57, by the way. Okay. Well, you know, I've got you by a few years. <laughs> okay, I'm going to move on. So, what do you think about the new lowered numbers considered hypertension now? This is like a three-part question. Oh, you know, uh, you're talking about the uh, a spirit study, I believe. Maybe I've got a wrong sprint or spirit study. It's been a couple of years since it's come out. And uh, what they showed was more aggressive treatment of high blood pressure. In other words, I, and again, I, it's been so long. And uh, anyway, I'd have to look at the, up the research, get the numbers right. So forgive me. But we right. always used to treat high blood pressure. The National Health Service of, uh, of Britain, uh, the British recommendations for treating high blood pressure, said that you should treat blood pressure sustained at 160 over 100 millimeters of mercury. Uh, the American Heart Association came out about five years ago <coughs> and said uh, uh, that people over 60 should uh, uh, only start treating high blood pressure when the blood pressure was uh, 100 and I believe 50 over 90 or greater or greater. Well, you know, this kind of uh, limitation of recommendations as to who should be on blood pressure medication uh, really narrows the market. Uh, if you broaden the market and you, you know, establish lower limits as to where you start treating, you know, that's billions of dollars for these drug companies. Right. Anyway, uh, they have they have uh, deep connections whether they identify them under the conflicts of interest of the scientific paper or not. Uh, these people are crooks, plain and simple. Uh, you know, they they do they do things in the interest of their uh, their their financial benefit factor. Benefactors, not in the interest of their patients. They violate their oath. But anyway, that's all another subject. Uh, the study, as I remember it, showed there was a reduction in uh, uh, some cardiovascular disease, but there were more episodes of uh, uh, hypotension where people would fall down, and there were more episodes of uh, low potassium where they'd get into trouble with low potassium. and. Uh, there, there was no reduction in heart attacks, I believe, but there was in strokes. Anyway, it's, uh, the, the benefits were quite exaggerated. And I would say half of the medical profession uh, uh, was more than just uh, counter-reactive. Counter uh, they were quite upset about these more aggressive recommendations. And the other half didn't quite, not quite know what to, uh, how to respond. You know, you got to be careful when recommendations come out as a doctor because you don't want to spend your time in court. And uh, certainly, uh, if you don't practice uh, the community standard of practice, then you put yourself at risk. So, you know, you have that problem with doctors uh, and whoever gets faulted for treating a patient. You only get faulted for not treating a patient. The more drugs they die with by the side of their bedside table, the more scars on their chest and abdomen the better the doctor must have been yeah. as the patient passes on to the next world. What a great doctor. Yes, he or she killed my dad or mom or child, but they tried hard. Look at the evidence. Anyway, <laughs> I've so, you know, and I say that in a context of some modern medical miracles. So don't, don't uh, fail to realize that I'm a real doctor. I really understand that we've made some uh, phenomenal progress in medicine, but we've missed a big problem, and that is that uh, most people in the world right now are suffering from problems that are easy to identify, and those are yep. problems of eating too much rich food yep. and not living on starch-based diets like the human being was designed to do. That's what they're sick. And my, and my, my colleagues, by and large, have missed this, and the reason they've missed it is because uh, there's not a uh, pretty young cheerleader coming to the office carrying uh, pizzas for the uh, front office staff and wearing seductive clothes for the male doctors. You know, uh, we don't have anybody selling rice or barley or potatoes uh, dressed that way and educated uh, to make, uh, you know, six-figure salaries. 
or they'd be five figure, five figure, six figure, ah, six figure. Anyway, uh, you know, it's it's finance, it's just just money. Nobody's trying to hurt you. It's just money. You, you figure out how to pay the people for causing them to be healthy, like I hear the Chinese used to do. Uh, you know, then maybe we would uh, have a system where we'd be rewarded for doing the right thing. But, you know, money talks, doesn't your business, doesn't mine. But there are a growing number of doctors who are getting the message and they are starting to treat yeah, this way. Yeah, they are, Chuck. But the problem is, is uh, they're finding out that it's hard to make money without pushing drugs. Yeah. And uh, very few of them have succeeded, like Mary and I have. But... You know, we went in with a, a, a lot of talent, a lot of uh, commitment, and we started 40 years ago. So we've made a very, very good living uh, doing what we believe to be the right thing. Whereas when uh, other doctors start out today, they're not quite as committed, I believe. And uh, the system is a little bit different than it was back then. I don't know. I, you know, I can't explain it, but I just don't see the, uh, my, my, even, you know, my fellow physicians who are supposed to be causing this movement, I don't, see, even they believe, and we're going back to believing, but not believing enough to take the action. And again, this, this, uh, there's a whole spectrum of, uh, of what I'm saying right here, <clears throat> all the way from folks like, uh, Dr. Campbell and Dr. Esselstyn, who've, uh, uh, like myself and a few other doctors uh, have put have put the truth ahead of everything else. You know, basically we've been willing to go out on the road and you know tell it like it is and face criticism. Uh, nothing greater than that, because when you tell the truth, uh, it's pretty hard to it's pretty hard to put up a defense or an offense. So the second part of that question. I think you already answered it. Does he have recommendations that he knows works for lowering blood pressure? I've tried all the things I know with no success. Well, go to my uh, website and look up high blood pressure. And I talk about how I treat it. <clears throat> and then you can also go and look at uh, my December 2013 newsletter and read about Walter Kepner, who uh, treated very severe high blood pressure with the rice diet back Yep. Uh, oh, for seven decades at Duke University. Uh, but for two decades, uh, the rice diet was the main financial support of Duke in Durham, North Carolina. And the rice diet would take people with very severe high blood pressure, like, say, 240 over 140 millimeters of mercury. And uh, he found that he could get about 60% of them down to normal blood pressure with the rice diet. Now, I have found only a few people. I mean, these are people with malignant hypertension. Uh, and it was the only race, well, way to treat that kind of blood, high blood pressure. Uh, back then, of course, we developed diuretics uh, subsequent to that, and that's where doctors and patients went, as opposed to something like the rice diet. But, uh, uh, you know, the average person doesn't have to make that kind of change. Uh, what I found, and we, we, found, we find that we can get within seven days uh, almost everybody to reduce or stop their blood pressure medication. Most of them stop. And uh, we can get a reduction in blood pressure of 18 over 11 millimeters of mercury, even stopping the medication. And uh, that means at the same time that most of these people are still using the salt shaker that we put on the table. So they're still getting salt. It's just the general change in diet uh, that makes a difference. A little exercise lowers blood pressure. So does sunshine blow blood pressure. Uh, but um, being away from their stressful job lowers blood pressure. Ult ultimately, <laughs> ultimately, these people get their health back, and that's the important thing. The blood pressure is just a sign telling them that they're sick. Uh, it's not, it's not uh, a disease itself. People don't die of high blood pressure or high cholesterol. These are just signs that say, hey, you know, you got problems. Uh, your arteries are rotting. We're gonna have bursting plaques and we're going to give you a stroke or heart attack and hey, your cells, uh, the metabolism is getting all goofed up and we're going to turn into uh, wild growth, uncontrolled growth, and we're going to kill you with cancer. And, you know, it's just these, these signs of being too fat, too high blood pressure, too high cholesterol, too high blood sugar, too high uh, triglycerides, uric acid, whatever, you know, we have all kinds of biomarkers. Mm -hmm. They're just signs. 
You know, I, I can just look at you, most of you, and I can tell you're sick. I, I don't need to check your blood. Uh, and it's not just your weight either. It's your skin tone, uh, lots of things. Uh, I've been at this for a long time. Okay. I, I, I've actually taken care of 12,000 people in my career. Touched them, talked to them. I was their doctor, 12,000 people. I've learned a lot about people in uh, my 52 years of experience. I purposely changed my doctor years ago just so I could have your son as my primary care. Well, my son, he was a professor at OHSU at the moment. Yeah. And uh, he's really going into the administrative part, like I said, a lot. Uh, but he has the advantage of not only having a traditional medical education, but he spent time learning from me. Right. And I think that combination of... Uh, a great education, a, a young man who has his uh, mom's personality. In other words, he gets along with people better than I do. <laughs> and, uh, the knowledge that I have and the truth, because he's not going to lose sight of the truth. As, you know, once you open your eyes, True. you can't close them. Uh, it's no. just the way it is in life. Somebody has to open your eyes. and We had the opportunity to do that for our, you know, our children and grandchildren. We have about 13 minutes left before you got to go. So I'm going to move on real quick. All right. In your video, Dr. McDougall says, what happens to that oil when you eat it? And then the answer is it goes under your skin and on your skin. I would love to have a clear, not too difficult to repeat answer to that question when somebody asks me in person. What are the damages that happen when we eat oil? Well, um, oil is an isolated concentrated nutrient. Uh, when you eat the oil in its uh, isolated form, outside of, say, the orange or the potato or the nut or seed, uh, you eat it without the other ingredients intended to go along with it, so that when the oil went into the cell, say, after eating an orange, it went into the cell along with some uh, fiber and some vitamin C and vitamin X, Y, Z. And, uh, you know, all of this was properly designed by nature over billions of years of evolution. Uh, so uh, you're taking in a highly concentrated isolated nutrient, which causes nutritional imbalances. And these are reflected in uh, changes, which can be best described most favorably as uh, they act like drugs. Uh, can be described as any drug could be described as, as a poison. You know, a, a drug can be a medicine or a chemical could be a medicine in one dose for one person and could be a poison True. for another in a different dose. True. So uh, at best, they can be described as medicines. They cause pharmacologic effects. For example, omega-3 fats uh, are known to suppress the immune system. Remember, the cod liver oil helps the joints uh, with their joint pain. Well. It doesn't oil the joints, it suppresses the immune system. Well, that suppression of the immune system uh, is generalized, and uh, as a result, you get more, more tumor growth, more cancer growth. Uh, you get suppression of the immune system, so you get more infections. Uh, anyway, it, uh, on, you, if you pick other oils, like omega-6s, uh, that are found predominantly in corn oil, what you find is... <clears throat> These omega-6s, uh, they actually cause more artery damage than does meat. So, you know, they're toxic. Uh, all of them you wear, the fat you eat, the fat you wear. The most efficient thing for the body to do is to stick the fat into your body fat. So it's, uh, you know, again, uh, this is not natural oil. It does not form any place in nature naturally. It's always mixed up with a conglomerate of uh, other chemicals that nature provided to make it safe, uh, eating the natural safe forms of oil, say in nuts and seeds and so on, avocados, I don't think is unhealthy. That's a lot of rich food. Certainly uh, set you up for weight gain. Okay. I have to tell you, um, when I started my blog years ago, there was no, as far as I knew at the time, there was no uh, plant-based movement or whole food plant-based, no oil or any of that. In fact, I didn't meet you until I watched uh, Jeff Nelson's Process People. And uh, I was like, who is that guy? I like him. But I, I called my site Brand New Vegan because at that time I thought vegan meant a diet. And I didn't realize it meant 
all the other stuff that goes along with it that we know today. So when people come to my blog or my group and they, they see brand new vegan, that's the first question they ask. What's wrong with oil? And I've written blog posts. I've pointed them to your website. I've explained it till I'm blue in the face. Well, you're, you're vegan. Oil is okay if you're vegan. And I get that argument between the vegan and the plant-based. And I want to say, I'm brand new vegan, but I follow a whole food plant-based no oil diet. But this is why, um, you know, when I, when I go to vegan conferences that I'm not too popular. Yeah. Uh, because, uh, you know, I point out, I, I, you know, here you are, half the audience. Uh, you're fat vegans. And uh, this is detracting from what you're trying to do, which is to save the animals and save the planet. So you walk up to somebody and you're 100 pounds overweight, you got oily skin and acne, and your skin's all gray and blue, and, you know, you can hardly get around. And you tell them this important message about changing their food. And the person looks at you and says, well, you know, I, I can understand not hurting animals. And, you know, I can understand well, we've got to save the planet, but good grief, if i got to look like you, <laughs> if i got to suffer like you, I'm not going to do it. So, you know, you're hurting a very important part of a message that I care a lot about. Mm -hmm. And I, I know you're not intentionally doing it. It's just you don't understand. Uh, and uh, there's a good share of the fat vegan population out there. In fact, I, I can tell you quite honestly, Chuck, I've gotten almost, almost no criticism by using that term fat vegan, both in a newsletter I wrote maybe 15 years ago and uh, a book I <clears throat> wrote in 2011 called The Start Solution. Uh, no one's uh, really, as far as I'm aware, uh, directly written me and said, you know, I'm offended by you discussing us, me being a fat vegan or whatever. Uh, I understand your intentions were to help, not only me personally, but uh, uh, what, I'm, what I believe in so strongly. So, you know, uh, sometimes you have to get down to, the, you know, some very basic discussions. And this one's that uh, been well accepted, I think, by the vegan community. But then again, they get mad at me because, well, for a whole bunch of reasons. <laughs> I, I, you know, uh, my job is not to win a popularity contest, Chuck. It's really <laughs> it's, it's not. I've never, I've never felt that was necessary. Okay, we got seven more minutes. Uh, you recommend being heavy on starches in your picture book video including potatoes. I've always read that those with arthritis symptoms should avoid nightshades. What is your take on that? Well, a guy named uh, Childers wrote that about, about, uh, about nightshades. And this is a book that was written probably in the 50s, maybe in the 60s. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, you know, I've, I, so I've been looking at this for a long time to see whether or not nightshades cause arthritis problems. And those would be potatoes, green peppers, uh, what else? Uh, anyway, potatoes, tomatoes, green peppers, and yeah, there's another one. Uh, mm -hmm. The nightshade plants. And uh, certainly they can be toxic. Potatoes can be toxic if you allow them to spoil. They produce yep. a green substance called solanine. Right. But otherwise, I've, I've really seen nothing but positive things about potatoes. and. I really have uh, a lot to say about potatoes in terms of saving the world. You know, I wrote an article in 2001, which you'll find on my website, about how potatoes uh, have served as the worldwide pillar of nutrition many times. Uh, along with uh, rice and corn, potatoes are uh, the bulk of the calories that people consume worldwide still. And uh, in the past, of course, it was over 90% of the diet was some kind of starchy food. So uh, I, I like the potato. You know, I, personally, I enjoy eating them. And uh, secondarily, they're a crop that really has sustainability. You can grow it in very dry climates. Uh, you can grow it, in high, grow it in high altitudes, low altitudes, wet climates. I mean, it really is a very, very, very hardy plant. So the potato, again, may, may save the world. Uh, 2008 was, was called the International Year of the Potato by the World Health Organization. Uh, you know, so somebody knows it's important to eat the potato and keep it as a dominant food supply. That's all we may have. Uh, and one part of the new slide presentation that I uh, am giving these days on, on the future, on how I see the future, 
is uh, everybody in the world is going to be eating a starch-based diet. I mean, there may be a couple of exceptions. I mean, there will be, there will be exceptions. There'll be people who will be starving to death, and there'll be a few kings and queens left. But by and large, most people will be eating a starch-based diet. And we can either learn how to eat this kind of diet before the tragedies become worse than they are, uh, or we can learn it afterwards when there's no, no choice. Uh, anyway. Is that the presentation I saw you give at Remedy? Yep. Okay. Yep. It, it, it needs a little work still, but I think I got my message across. Uh, that room was just so quiet you could hear a pin drop. Yeah. Well, you know, it's uh, my passion is there, Chuck. Oh, I know. I know. I've heard you give this many times, and uh, we appreciate what you do. We really do. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate your efforts uh, going out and trying to help the people. I have one more question for you. All right. If I could teach my followers, it, let's say my private group only, that's 18,000 people. If I could teach them one single thing, what should it be? Uh, it's the food. It's the food. Yeah. You know, we say it on our website. We've been saying it for, um, you know, dozens of years. It's the food. You know, uh, stop, stop screwing around with the lifestyle stuff. It's the food. Thank you very much, Dr. Medjugorje. Okie dokie. Well, keep up the keep up the hard work. There you go, Dr. John McDougall. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, be sure and give me a thumbs up and uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Be sure and hit that notification button so you get notified of any new recipe, including some possible interviews too. Anyway, this is Chuck from Brand New Vegan again. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.